Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Darren James with the Association of Former British Colonies. Today we have a guest by the name of Melissa Ramnorth. Now she is uh, she's a lawyer in the United States, and in her spare time, one of her hobbies, uh, she runs a West Indian history page, which speaks to the experience of the Indo-Caribbeans. But we're going to get into that um, in, in just a moment. So. Um, I'll, I'll let Melissa uh, expand on, on what she does um, uh, in her personal and professional capacity. So for the benefit of the audience, Melissa, could you just uh, tell us a bit about your personal and professional background? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to uh, work with you guys on this. And so my name is Melissa Ramnoth, and I'm a lawyer. I practice trademarks and I am of Trinidadian and Guyanese descent. I was born in Miami and I'm married with three children and me and my husband run our trademark law firm and we help uh, business owners and website owners protect their names and logos and branding. Brilliant. Um, so you said that you're of Guyanese descent? Yes, my father's from Guyana and my mom's from Trinidad. Oh, right. Okay. So, so given your um, ethnic background, is that something which was a drive behind you launching the West Indian history page? What was it? Yes. Um, a few years ago, I was just, I really wanted to know where I came from. I didn't have access to this information growing up. They didn't teach it to us in school. So I just bought all the books I could find online and I was so excited, so I just wanted to share what I was learning with my peers. I knew my own cousins and my sister, they didn't know, so I figured other people wouldn't know, and I was just sharing what I was learning. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay, so um, in, in terms of um, um, uh, what you've learned, um, is that pretty much from, you know, if we're to put it in layman's terms, so is it Sorry, sorry. What you've learned is it basically how the Indian diaspora ended up in, in the Caribbean and, and what happened afterwards sort of thing. Yes. And so I had no sense of timeline, statistics or anything like that. I just knew at some point someone of my great grandparents came to the Caribbean from India. I didn't know anything uh, other than that. And through my research, I learned that it was through the indentured servitude uh, system and it started in 1838 and it ended in 1920 and it coincided with the end of slavery and the beginning of the system. All right, so uh, I know it's, you know, it's it is common knowledge that um, the Caribbean is a multi-ethnic, multi-faith sort of society. Um, you know, some of some of the more well-known bits of history is that the the black population, most of which have come from Western Africa um, through the transatlantic slave trade. Um, how is it that the Indians uh, came to the Caribbean? Yes, so um, in terms of Guyana, the first uh, plantation owner to ask for Indians to come and work to replace the enslaved Africans, his name was Joseph Gladstone. He asked the UK for permission, they granted it. And after that, the indentured servitude system expanded to Trinidad and the rest of the Caribbean. And so it's my understanding based on attending other presentations that most Indians came from Northern India that ended up in Trinidad and Guyana. If they came from South India and they ended up in those countries, they were in the minority. And so that's something I learned recently by attending a presentation. Oh, brilliant. So, so you mentioned, you've touched upon the Indian indentureship system. Now, um, could you explain, you know, how were the, how are the Indians treated um, within the remit of that system? Oh, sure. So the system, it, in theory, it is where Indian indenture, Indians would sign up for a contract period of about five years. They were to go and work and return home. In reality, they were exploited. They didn't really know what they were getting into. 
Many of them were kidnapped or tricked into coming into the Caribbean. And so when they arrived at the Caribbean, the work and living conditions were extremely inhumane and oppressive. And most of them didn't even end up returning to India, either because there wasn't a passage available for them or their contracts were just extended without their consent. All right, so they were essentially brought over from India, different parts of India um, mm -hmm. for, for, for cheap labor. You know, um, I think the only comparable description of that is, is you know, what happened in the slave trade, but, uh, but I guess it was next to, the, the, the remuneration for that was, was next to nothing sort of thing. Right, the, the two systems are you know, extremely inhumane and oppressive. A lot of people compare them and say that they are very similar. Um, in my view, they are. there are similarities, but it's important to maintain that they are different systems and there were different outcomes of each. Yeah, because they, 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 they heard at different times sort of thing. Um, now, you, you touched upon this previously now in, in terms of the indian indentureship system it, is that something which um you know for yourself being an indo-caribbean lady is that that's something which you which is spoken about within the diaspora growing up uh me personally it wasn't really spoken about one time i asked my grandfather where did our ancestors come from? And he basically said it was just a very sad situation. He didn't give me much information. I don't think he himself knew exactly because they didn't really have access to that information either. So it wasn't spoken about, but it was just a known, it was just a known sort of sadness that occurred in our history. Yeah, no, I can appreciate that because now we have access to the internet whereby we can do a quick Google search and find, you know, anything about anything. Um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, going back um, a couple of decades and whatnot, we didn't have that and, and any any sort of uh, previous trauma um, from our grandparents that they, they, they would have probably felt um, the need to not burden us with that knowledge, um, you know, for better or for worse. Now, are you, are you aware of any of the lasting impacts of the indentureship system, um, even that which is seen in contemporary society? Uh, one impact that I read about and it kind of opened my eyes to seeing is uh, the racial tensions um, between the African descendants and the Indian descendants. It's still very present in the Caribbean today. And it's my opinion that it stemmed from colonial colonial times, the planters and the colonists, they didn't want the two groups to unite. So a lot of those tensions stem from that time and are persistent today. Yeah. Um, so being of uh, Trinidadian and Ghanese um, origin, uh, have you have you visited those those places as well? Yes, I have. And I wish I could go back now because I visited before I knew a lot of the information and education um, that I recently learned about. So it'd be really cool to go back and see and maybe make a stop at the archives offices in each of the countries to try to trace my family history. Yes, no, sure, because you, you did make an interesting point about the, the segregation aspect. That's something that, you know, I, I generally wasn't wasn't aware of. Um, I know, for example, in the United States, you know, you get you get black neighborhoods, you get white neighborhoods, you get Latino neighborhoods, and then you probably get some mixed similar, similar to what you see in the UK. Um, you know, in, in some of the more affluent neighborhoods, they tend to be typically white and some of the more less uh, the the neighborhoods with less sort of attention from the government tend to be less white so you know it's see, see, you know. so i say that to say this so in in you know places like trinidad and guyana do they have this similar sort of thing whereby you have neighborhoods where there's predominantly indian neighborhoods where there's blacks um, is there any sort of intermixing i wouldn't be able to speak too much on that because yeah. i did not live there and i'm not from there and i've only visited um yeah. once to each country but I will say that I read that when the enslaved Africans were freed, 
they started their own villages. And so based on what I read, it's my understanding that at least back then the villages started off separate. And so probably now they're mixed. So yeah. that's what I think happened as well there too. So um, in and amongst you know the Guyanese Trinidadian um, community, um, what are the attitudes towards um, colonization in those countries and you know, let's say the wider Caribbean? Yeah, it's my impression that what I see from my peers and just what I see online is that it there is a stronger sense against what happened, uh, a more more outrage, you know, in more recent times as we learn about what happened, how the systems were so difficult, people are able to have these strong beliefs based on the new information that they're learning. So before everybody was you know, caught up just trying to survive, we didn't have access to this information. Now we're sharing we, with each other what we're learning and we realize just how oppressive it was and how reparations should be made for those systems yeah yeah because i know that you know in terms of reparations you know caricom how, how do you have uh, do you have a, a, a sort of centralized system uh, which defines um what reparations would look like um for for those countries now i think trinidad and tobago as well are part of caricom but um, there are a number of different things and it's not just financial but you know colonization has, has essentially you know civilized or pushed one country into the future at the expense of another which is stood frozen in time so of course that's that's something which you know that you can see the you can see that worldwide you know beyond the caribbean as well um now from from your perspective are there any perceivable sort of impacts of independence on those countries um what I have been learning about as well is that even though these countries were granted independence in the 50s and 60s, there was still a lot of outside influence politically from the major world leaders. For example, in the 1960s, the US and the UK, they allegedly meddled in the elections in Guyana and that you know had a tremendous impact for the next few decades as to who was the president. And so with the recent oil findings in Guyana, it seems like that kind of is repeating itself. A lot of the American powerhouse companies are going in there and kind of putting these one-sided contracts in front of the Guyanese to sign. And it's just concerning that this is happening. Yes, because from from one off one I've seen, you know, colonization uh, it, it's gone away from let's say empire and gone to more of an economic sort of situation. You know, for example, you know, British Airways, which is a uh, a British airline, um, they that airline is the only airline which is allowed to fly uh, between the UK um, and uh, and certain Caribbean countries. Uh, you know, or for or for example, like the British Virgin Islands. Um, their foreign policy is dictated by the UK, um, even though you know it's how many thousands of miles across the Atlantic. So, I think that um, a British colonization, it, I think it's still here, but but it operates in a slightly different different way, in a more of an more of a, an economic way, which benefits the mother country, so to speak. Um, now you did I touch. Didn't, upon I didn't even know that. Thank you for telling me about the British Airways. It's really important. I'm, I'm sure a lot of us don't don't know that either. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's, it's I guess it's a, a a technique to economically stifle a nation uh, so that it's dependent upon uh, you know the mother country for for for, for services such as airlines, etc. You know, um, and uh, you know, and that's just one example of it. You know, um, now you you did touch on reparations uh just briefly now um you know we you know I, you know i'm of caribbean descent you know my father's jamaican and my mother um the descends from the senkits and nevis um you know we're aware of that you know that there's being you know a push for reparations we, you know we've got caricom etc um so we are we are aware of, of certain things but within um the 
Indo-Caribbean diaspora, is there a comparable level of push for um, reparations of some form? Well, I know that I am pushing for reparations in the form of digitizing and preserving the ship records related to enslaved Africans and Indian indentured servants. The UK government primarily, but also the local governments, they owe their citizens and the descendants of their citizens a duty to protect these records because they are hundreds of years old. They are deteriorating. Some of them have already been lost. It's 2023. We need to make sure that these records are online, safe, and available to everyone to view. And so if these governments don't act now, the records could be lost. And in most cases, this is probably the only link for us to determine which ancestor came to India, where they came, um, I'm sorry, which, which ancestors came to the Caribbean, where yes. they came from, what ship they came on. I know it would not be the same for enslaved Africans to find out, you know, a specific name, but maybe it could help, you know, narrow down a timeline, or maybe if you put the pieces together, it could give you an, an indication as to which area your um, ancestors came from as well. You know, that is an interesting point that you've raised, you know, because being of, of, of Caribbean descent myself, you know, my lineage stops in, in the Caribbean. I don't know how, how much further back it goes or which African country I was I was originally from. Um, you know, to do that, we have to do blood tests and things like that to, to get those results, um, which brings brings me on to, an, to another sort of question. So, you know, we have the Indo-Caribbeans, you know, you know, we know they're there, you know, um, you know, they've existed in the Caribbean for many decades now. Um, ha is there still an attachment to India in any sort of way? Personally, I don't really see any close connection to India. You know, if you meet an Indian, they are very different from somebody in the Caribbean. It, it we do we do not speak the language. We do not eat much of their foods. Our foods are unique to the Caribbean or have been modified throughout the decades. We like different music. So it's just kind of a sense that that is a motherland, but it is not our culture. Yes. yes. My, mom, my mom always told me that India was our background, but our culture and we are from Trinidad and Guyana. And it yes, makes no. sense now. Now I understand what it means. Yeah, no, that that is definitely a beautiful thing, you know. Um, you know, um, although that although that you know your ancestors, you know, were taken from one part of the world to another. Um, there's, you know, same thing with African. There, there has been a cultural attachment, but you know, culture is, is what the people make it. Uh, and I think you know, especially you know, being in Jamaica and whatnot, um, they've done just that. Um, and I, and I trust that it's the same um, within Trinidad and. Tobago. Um, so um, that does wrap up the questions that I have for you um, in this segment, Melissa. Um, now, I understand that you are on Instagram. Could you just share with the audience what your Instagram is? Yes, my Instagram is West Indian History. It's where I share whatever I found that week or that month in my research. Um, Lately, the last year, it's been about the ships, whatever ships came from India to Trinidad and Guyana. I try to write about a ship that I found that came there um, that month. And in the last year of my research, I haven't been able to find any information about ships that brought enslaved Africans. So if anybody knows of any books or resources where I can learn about these African ships, I would really appreciate it. Yes, yes. Uh, so you've heard Melissa's call. If anybody knows of any other research, any sources where we can get further information, please do drop it down in the comment section. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you uh, today, Melissa, uh, and I'm sure we'll uh, speak again in the future. Thank you so much. It's been great. I'm glad to work with you guys. Thank you.